Okay, so we get started. Can the Mekong be saved? A warm welcome to our panelists, Sila, Tanaporn, and Anulak, and to all participants. This webinar explores the role of science and local knowledge in tackling the threats to the Mekong ecosystems and communities. It was organized by InterNews' Earth Journalism Network, the Sustainable Mekong Region Research Network, or SummerNet. InterNews is an international NGO working to ensure people have access to trusted, timely, and accurate information. The Earth Journalism Program in that of InterNews is a big community of more than 12,000 environmental journalists. I'm Louis LaBelle from Shanghai University. I'm your moderator today. The rules are simple. Panelists, stay within your lot of time within your opening remarks. Otherwise, you'll have no discussion at all. Participants, please keep your post short. Put your questions into the QA tab and comments in the chat. We should have good inter interaction. Rajesh, as a pre-panelist, please lead us in to the topic. Okay, we're waiting for Rajesh to get us started. Can you see my screen? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Rajesh. I am with Summernet and Stockholm Environment Institute Asia, and I'm communications coordinator. Uh, I just have a very quick two slides. Uh, one is to introduce Summernet, because a lot of you may not be familiar with what Summernet is, and a quick uh, briefing on what the background to this webinar is. <clears throat> Summonet, uh, who we are, we are a regional scientific research and knowledge network uh, with more than 300 members. Uh, we are committed to the sustainable development of the Mekong region. And what do we do? Uh, we do policy relevant res research and outreach activities to inform and engage with policymakers, media, think tanks, and others. In the present phase of work uh, ongoing for the next 10 years, we are focusing on water insecurity. And our aim is to reduce water insecurity for all, in particular the poor, marginalized, and socially vulnerable groups of women and men in the Mekong region. Um, now about the webinar itself. Uh, this is part of our work with the media. Summonet works closely with the media because uh, uh, we know that media is a key conduit between science and those who decide the scope of political discourse, including solutions. Uh, we know that media can help steer policy agendas and policy actors towards urgent action. But we also know from our experience working with media that journalists are not always able to unpack science or report on complex environmental topics. Uh, sometimes they don't even have enough resources. They have faced constraints of time. So we have worked closely with media to, for example, provide uh, media grants, uh, fellowships, and mentoring for early career journalists. Uh, we invite people, uh, journalists and media people to field visits to our project sites so they can report on things like climate change. And we also do science media workshops like this one, like this ongoing webinar. Uh, so this webinar is part of our efforts to bring science and media together, uh, especially. And we have three aims. One, we, have, we want to share perspectives 
among different levels, from the local to the transboundary levels, on the state of knowledge of the Mekong. Two, we wish to identify how scientific experts, community groups, and the media can work together to help policymakers make better informed management decisions. And lastly, we want to explore the changes needed to safeguard the health of the Mekong ecosystems and the local communities who depend on these ecosystems. Thank you. Richard. We hope this helps in our efforts for the ecological recovery of the Mekong. I look forward to an engaging and useful webinar. Uh, thank you very much to all, all of you who have taken the time to participate. Over to you, Louis. Thank you very much, Rajesh, for getting us started. Can the Mekong be saved by local communities? Please welcome our first panelist, Sila, Project Management Coordinator in the Wonders of the Mekong Project, Cambodia. Go ahead, Sila. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sila from Wonder the Mekong Order Project. Today, I would like to present you about the webinar Can the Mekong Be Sale? And uh, just uh, before starting, I just introduced about the Wonder the Mekong Project, is the project funded by the USAID and a partnership with the University of Nevada, Reno, and also the Inland Fishery Research and Development Institute of the Fishery and Recreation in Cambodia and other partners. And so I would like to share about the role of the science and the local knowledge that can be used to uh, mitigate the threat facing Mekong ecosystem and the community. And they both are very important because uh, it can be improved understanding management and appreciation of the functional healthy Mekong River through fishery or biodiversity research. And the community action research, document the story and information around the, uh, based on their local knowledge or perception of the surrounding environment. And the local knowledge might be safe based on the environmental change. However, the contribution to the local capacity building among the villagers, for example, the participatory action learning and the result uh, uh, have been uh, shared and then discussed among the management plan. For example, the Sarapum uh, action research, Taiwan research, or Vietnam uh, 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 action research in the Mekong data. And some of the lo local researchers uh, from the commune, they become the recognition and the respect from other people or become the local authority uh, or local expert in fish or herb or bird uh, uh, in that area. About the Mekong, so based on the scientific research and also the commune uh, uh, knowledge, so Mekong is very important is the, uh, uh, they have the largest inland fishery. They have the high diversity, uh, especially the more than 800 uh, fish species. And also the up to uh, 300 kilograms of the giant, giant fish. And they feed to uh, uh, many, many people in the uh, uh, Mekong area. So the Mekong in Cambodia is the last retreat for the indentured wildlife. It is uh, the life support uh, system for community in the past and also in the present uh, throughout Cambodia. So how to sell Mekong? The, the connectivity is the critical uh, for the migratory uh, fish species to assess the critical habitat for the successful reproduction and the feeding. So you can see this is the, uh, the Mekong River flows uh, to, uh, through Cambodia. And they have the, uh, in Cambodia, we have the Mekong, the Lesam, and also the Sri S River that, that uh, have the diversity uh, ecosystem and uh, productive. So to, to have the uh, migratory fish alive or giant uh, fish alive, we need to maintain of the healthy and connected habitat. And this is the uh, giant catfish. This is the uh, indentured uh, migratory 
fish species and uh, each species have uh, their own story, their own belief, people believe in the makeup of fish. And uh, for example, the, the giant fish, based on the research, is the large freshwater fish in the world. And the uh, giant barb is the national Cambodian uh, fish. And uh, it can be bring uh, bad luck if you kill that uh, some kind of the fish. So based on the research uh, that just public recently, the mega fish of the Mekong uh, River Basin are now extremely rare and highly endangered due to the illegal uh, fishing activity, habitat degradation, and block migration. And we need to have uh, more research on that because uh, more data is still uh, uh, don't have maybe due to the economic value of the kind of the uh, mega fish. And also uh, people don't want to report uh, their kind uh, to the uh, researcher. That's why the Wonder on the Mekong project try to promote the uh, scientific research through support students and also the uh, uh, postdoc researcher and also the freelance researcher to start to uh, document about the natural resource and the biodiversity. So we work with the uh, different uh, university in Phnom Penh and also in the US in other uh, countries to start to research about the biodiversity. And uh, the project also tried to uh, raise awareness or appreciate the people uh, called as the Mekong Conservation Arrow, uh, let them tell about the uh, information about the, uh, how they work to raise awareness about the Mekong River Ecosystem Services. Uh, and uh, now we call this a kind of hero. The project also try to uh, promote uh, people to love nature and uh, protect environment. So we work with uh, different people uh, from the student kids until the uh, high level people. And we try to produce the environmental uh, communication material and engage with the student to clean the river, uh, to, to uh, know the uh, uh, key uh, uh, fish species in Cambodia. And we also uh, have the science fish uh, research, for example, study about the genetic and DNA. And this is another uh, part of the project is the conservation supplementary program. Collect, we try to collect from the uh, fish uh, larva or juvenile, keep storage in the pond. And then when they come uh, grow up bigger and healthier, we'll, we uh, release them back to the Mekong River because we want to track about their migratory uh, pattern. Uh, and this is another uh, story that we try to document about the people story, try to protect. So we, we call the Kingfisher a special. We had a one, two, three. Uh, we document uh, people who love the fish, who release the uh, Mekong fish uh, to the river bed. And in October 23, uh, fishery administration working with the Wanda the Mekong project and to celebrate the one uh, World Fish Migration Day by releasing the endangered fishes, uh, Mekong giant barb, uh, to the river and uh, it around uh, 10,000 uh, fish uh, released back to the Mekong River in Phnom Penh. So to sell Mekong, it requires a number of broad scale. It, 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 it needs a strategy from local, national, regional, and international. And a support site and best management, we need to conduct the research. But also, we need to uh, appreciate local knowledge to maintain the healthy uh, natural resource that provide good and service that uh, sustain life and improve the uh, new and well being. And everyone should provide a voice and a mechanism for all, especially the poor and vulnerable group to join the planning and decision-making in the management of the Mekong. 
So we can working together for a healthy Mekong Kong River, not alone can deal it. So learning from the New Zealand, New Zealand government grant the legal right for the Wanganui River as the first river in the world to be recognized as the living entity. So uh, Dr. Zeb Hogan, a uh, conservation biologist, research scientist, research uh, assistant professor at the University of Nevada, and also he also director of the Wanda the Mekong. He think that Mekong River should have right because they're important for people and uh, wildlife. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sheila. I have one question. I can't get my camera to go up, but anyway. And thank you, Sheila, for your this description of the Mekong Wonders Project and the many scales and strategy. But I have just one question for you. What intrigued me was your work on community-based management, yeah. your history of working with communities. And I was wondering, under what conditions does community-led wetland and river management to help reduce threats to Mekong ecosystem and communities. Not just communities on the side helping a little bit here and there, but when they really take the lead, what, under what conditions can they do so and be effective? Yeah, uh, based on uh, the experience that I work with the Salapung research uh, project in the community based uh, action research. So they try to document uh, their story about the fish herb for medicine and uh, later on they document the story uh, uh, they document about they found that 130 fish species in the four uh, village in that area and the result from the platform research also uh, uh, integrate in the tung trai tam sa sai management plan uh, as part of the four 14,000 hectares is the Stung Trai Ramsa side, is the strength uh, along the Mekong River in Stung Trai province. So it is uh, one uh, a success story that uh, local, uh, local uh, knowledge have been uh, documented and be integrated in the management plan. And uh, currently, there are uh, uh, different organizations that uh, try to uh, follow up or work with the uh, different uh, village to document the uh, community uh, knowledge, life fish or other uh, uh, habitat in that area. Okay, thank you very much, Sila. We're collecting some questions from the chat and we'll come back to you after the third panelist and you'll be able to check out the chat and the Q&A. There's some questions, more questions for you there from the participants. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to turn to, can the Mekong be saved by an international river basin organization? Sorry, our second speaker. Can the Mekong be saved by more scientific research, I should say. Our second speaker is Dr. Tanapon Piman, a senior research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute for Southeast Asia, SCI in Asia. Please, Dr. Tanapon, the floor is yours. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Luis. So, this is my uh, uh, great pleasure to be a part of the people who want to to save the Mekong. Uh, wait a minute, I try to share my slide. Okay. So, uh, the topic that I would like to share in this webinar is what kind of the knowledge and data sharing is needed to save the Mekong. So I would like to start that uh, now Mekong is changing under three uh, aspects. One is a physical and environmental change from the increased regulated of the tributary and mainstream river and the climate change impact. Second changing in the Mekong is demographic and society uh, chain as the economic of the region grows. And the last one is about the in institutional chains with a new and expanding regional cooperation mechanism. So uh, uh, this chain is lead to the 
environmental change. The key environmental change in the Mekong Basin now that we can observe uh, from the uh, monitoring station, from the people who live and depend on the Mekong River, it's about first one is a daily and seasonal flow pattern change. Second, it's about the sediment and nutrient transportation. In last uh, drought periods, I think there are many uh, uh, local people have noted that the Mekong, the color of the Mekong River is become from blue to green. So this is another kind of signal on the reduction of the sediment in the Mekong River. And the most important uh, chain that also connect with the local people in the Mekong along the river is about loss of the wetland floodplain, loss of the habitat, biodiversity, and fish migration routes. So these chains are the main cause that make the people don't feel that Mekong is safe anymore. So that's why uh, our job as a scientist and researcher, we have to try to ensure that the knowledge and science have been uh, influenced in the practice and decision making to better management in terms of uh, water resource or natural resource across the basin. So let me uh, take you back in last 10 years when is the development happening in the basin particularly lack water resort, uh, lack water resort development. So uh, in this uh, slide show that uh, we try to use the most knowledge and information to assess the strategic and mental assessment of hydropower on the mainstream. In 2010, there is no, there was no, uh, uh, mainstream hydropower in the Mekong River yet. F from that, we also try to do uh, uh, the basin-wide assessment scenario to look at different scenario across the Mekong and to try to provide uh, the strategic direction for the Mekong water resource management and development. And of course, as you know now, there's already through uh, hydropower uh, project on the mainstream installed in the system. And at that time in 2011, many uh, knowledge and science also have been used to provide recommendation to the Chayaburi hydropower projects to ensure that uh, the project are sustainable and to make sure that project uh, also uh, was at uh, follow the guideline as the regional uh, platform. Recently, uh, there are also a big study called the Causal Study that tried to look at the sustainable management and development of Mekong Basin, including impact of mainstream hydropower projects. So this study take quite a lot of time for, I mean, three to four years to complete the study by gathering a lot of information, knowledge, and science to come to the uh, policy recommendation and to use to develop a basin development strategy. So this is just show you how the uh, knowledge and science are used in the regional planning. Moreover, of course, at the cloud level, there are many also research activity like SummerNet or other research uh, platform that try to help the local community to address uh, uh, the issue and also to adapt from the changing of the Mekong. So I come back to the importance of the knowledge and science for the river basin planning. Uh, first, they will improve the understanding. And second is they will write public awareness. So this is the main contribution of the science and, and knowledge in the part that I have seen from my experience when I work in the Mekong Basin for almost 15 years. But however, our ultimate goal of using the science is to have a better natural or resource management or improve decision-making and practice. 
So these two important are still questioning how much the science have impact in these two areas. So at the end, uh, I would like to highlight what are the information and knowledge needs right now to save the Mekong. First, uh, in last 10 years, I, uh, I think we try a lot to get the uh, flow monitoring data from the uh, upper Mekong or from the Lanchang uh, River. Uh, I think last week we have very good news that uh, China have uh, agreed to share the data to the lower Mekong country for year rounds. So this is another success in terms of data sharing. But of course, sharing data across the country is quite challenging and it takes time. So the list that I show here in the presentation, including the daily release flow from the Lax Dam, daily flow monitoring in the upper Mekong and main tributary are still the gap. As I mentioned to you now, the Mekong is changing from the natural flow to the regulation flow. If we don't know the regulation flow, then it's very hard to manage flow downstream. And moreover, the current system, they are not well functioned yet in terms of drought and flow fluctuation along the Mekong River. And also we now see a lot of kind of negative impact uh, from the current development, you know, from the local people. But however, the impact uh, is not reported in the systematic yet. So to have a big impact, so we need to strengthen in terms of reporting about social and mental and economic impacts. And at the end, when we talk about decision making, it's not only the water, the decision making is sometimes beyond the water, like energy sector, like economic sector. So that's why, or the financial sector. So this information also important that we need to know how the power of decision it apply in the developing large uh, uh, project in the basin. So that is all my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tanapon. Thank you very much, Dr. Tanapon. From, I have just one question for you. It seems your summary seems spot on. The scientific knowledge has clearly influenced understanding and raised awareness and even influenced regional planning. But what is needed to actually move to better resources management to improve decision-making and practices? Do you have any I initial ideas on how we can improve, especially now that we have to think about cascades of projects and not individual projects. Yeah, thank you very much, Kului. Uh, yes, actually, uh, as I mentioned, it's linked to the last slide of I show here. So how to improve the uh, uh, decision making and uh, natural resource management. As I mentioned now, the decision making, uh, there are many uh, decision maker in different state, you know. So for my experience, now we are very much focused on the, the, the platform related to the water. So my uh, uh, opinion is we need to use science beyond the water to influence other decision maker outside the water sphere, like a financial uh, uh, mechanism, energy sector, you know. So and also maybe try to also use the knowledge and, and, and data to strengthen environmental sector that are way behind the scene or consider at the end of the pie. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Tanapon. Can the Mekong be saved by an international river basin organization? Our third speaker is Dr. Anulak Kitikon, Chief Strategy Partnership Officer at the Mekong River Commission. I'd like to hand over to Dr. Anulak, please. I look forward very much to hearing what you have to say. Thank, thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Luis. And uh, thanks again, I think, SEI uh, for the invitation to, to join this session. Uh, it's good to be among friends. Uh, Dr. Tanokon, uh, I think Dr. Chayanis is also there. Dr. Chen Jira, all M MRC uh, alumni. And uh, of course, uh, to, to engage with uh, local stakeholders and, and researchers. So um, can you put up my slide?
So Dr. Tanapon, he, he already, I think I agree with him uh, on the challenges facing the Mekong. Uh, he already, uh, I think, identified you know, some of the significant changes in terms of the physical changes, the institutional changes, the economic and societal changes. So, uh, but I think uh, among that, my first slide, if you click next, um, among that, I think uh, from, from a MRC point of view, you know, the Mekong River Commission, uh, it's for sustainable development. So, uh, uh, you know, environment protection and social uh, protection is, is largely part of that, but also we also facilitate, you know, uh, responsible and sustainable development. So from our point of view, there is some opportunities left for development, but the question is how to do that uh, responsibly and, and, and sustainably. So if you could go to my next slide, uh, which is only one slide. So the Mekong countries, um, along with uh, extensive consultation with stakeholders uh, at both regional and national levels uh, and, and, and a few uh, regional stakeholder forums have come to derive at this uh, new basin development strategy. So the title is uh, the basin development strategy for two, 2021 to 2030. So it, it's a basin wide strategy and a subset of that is for the MRC in terms of our strategic plan. So it has these five dimensions. Uh, if you look at um, say under the environment dimension, you know, how, how do we protect the environment? So there's a strategic priority on maintaining the ecological function of the Mekong. We know that the flows have changed we know that it's not a natural flow anymore. Uh, so how do we um, come up with new flow limits and, 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 and thresholds in order to monitor so that the, um, the uh, ecological functions can be maintained? Secondly, we know about sediment reduction. So as of now, uh, what the Mekong River Commission and others are doing is just monitoring. So, so there is a strategic direction to have a basin wide uh, sediment management plan, for example, that takes into account not only transportation of sediment through dams and barriers, for example, but also say sand mining, etc., which is a big challenge in the basin. And third, uh, we, we heard, uh, you know, Tanapon talks about loss of wetlands and environmental assets. So if we don't do anything about this, there will be continued to be reduction. So, so there is in the strategy, we talk about limits of change you know, so, so there are some opportunities for development, but where are the limits? So this, I think countries and stakeholders need to discuss and define. So that's under the environment. Under the social area, I think we have a lot of anecdotal evidence and also case-specific studies about local vulnerabilities, about the different impacts on women and men, but there is no systematic uh, data or uh, efforts in terms of understanding where vulnerabilities lie, where gender differences in terms of impacts lie, especially in the water uh, related sectors. So there is uh, a place in the new strategy to address gender and vulnerability so that um, you know, our most vulnerable people can be, can be um, safe uh, and, and help them adapt to these changes. So that's under the social, under the economic, um, Dr. Tanapon talks about the previous assessment, for example, MRC and others have done, which is really about assessing the impacts of national plans, for example. And then we provide some recommendations, oh, you don't do this, you don't do that, you know, to the member countries. And so far, um, you know, some have made into uh, decision making, but largely there is a feeling that, um, you know, these are not having an impact. So in the new strategy, we, we call it from reactive planning to proactive planning, meaning instead of just analyzing the impacts of national plans, we should propose uh, options on the table, which is you know, propose for joint projects, propose for joint actions. And maybe uh, if the country sees that uh, these new proposed joint projects and joint investment are better than what they are currently planning, then they, they will adopt it. So that is a basis behind our new uh, basin development plan. And secondly, um, we talk, I think we heard Sheila talks about the importance of fish. So fish, um, I think so far we have been trying to monitor and we have trying, been trying to protect. But so, so those efforts are very good and, and needed. But at the same time, you need to also imagine a sort of a future where 
you know, the fish landscape has already changed. So you need to change with it. Uh, so there is, there, there is an output in the strategy where you need to work with stakeholders, work with local uh, communities, and imagine how the changing fishery landscape of the basin uh, can be optimized even more, right? Rather than just protecting what we have. Uh, and finally, uh, we have the uh, dimension on the um, uh, climate and cooperation. And for climate, I think we know very well, you know, about the climate change. We know very well about the uh, more infrastructure projects in the basin. But uh, in the new strategy, there is an effort to, um, you know, move from starting with data information sharing, which is very important, to notification, which is the second step, to possibly coordinate how the uh, uh, water infrastructures could be operated to, so that you can meet multiple purposes, right? Drought, flood, uh, environment, et cetera. But, but this is very challenging work. And, and, and some of the countries, of course, have, you know, uh, uh, are very well known in terms of uh, their sovereign um, decisions in terms of how they operate their, their infrastructure. So, but, but, but this has now been agreed in the strategy to, to explore, to, to see where we can go. And finally, uh, on the cooperation dimension, I think um, you know we have a different institutional landscape right now. You know, not not only the MRC, but several cooperation frameworks. You can name it: uh, Mekong Korea, Mekong Japan, U.S. Mekong now, uh, Lansang Mekong. Uh, somebody said elephant in the room. So, so how do these all of these fit together? And 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 what is the role of each in Mekong Basin management? Some of them are very broad cooperation framework. Some of them could be more specific. So we know, for example, the MRC, what our clear core functions are, but some of these are not known and, and, and people have different perceptions about what each is or, or what each is trying to do, uh, especially I think we service the, the Mekong Lansang. So, so there is a place in the, in the strategy to define these clear roles and, and, and to champion whatever the role is to minimize duplication and to uh, sort of build synergies. So, so in conclusion, uh, the new strategy is about proactive planning. It's about adaptation and it's about higher, higher level cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nulak. I li like the way you're able to communicate so much with a single infographic. I have one, just one question for you and I'm not gonna take I'm not going to take the very political questions yet because they're coming up in the Q&A, but I've always felt that the MRC or the MRC Secretariat, one of its roles was to act as a boundary organization to help mediate using assessments and other process, mediate the flows of demands of policy and decision makers, regional planners, and those from the scientific community and sort of act as a, be accountable in both directions. Do you see the MRC Secretariat or the MRC itself as being a boundary organization? Boundary organization, right? right. Is that Luke? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Mekong River Commission is an intergovernmental organization, right? It, it, it has a, a very clear governance structure, you know, at the highest level, you can go all the way to the prime ministers and then below that the ministers and then below that the heads of departments that deals with water. And then the secretariat serve as a sort of administrative, technical and facilitating arm, right? So, um, so that is very clear. And um, for all of us who works in the secretariat, we, we take science very seriously. Uh, we take uh, facilitation very seriously, but we are not um, sort of a, a body that listens to one particular voice, right? So, so in that mediation of facilitation efforts, we look at the science, we tell the member countries based on our objective research, this is what it should be like. But then at the same time, we are owned by the four member countries' governments, right? So, so in any decisions, uh, they ultimately make the decisions. So, so we produce, say, uh, technical papers, technical reports, but all, for example, strategies or guidelines or procedures, uh, they go through a process, right, where there's a give and take between the secretariat, between the member countries, uh, between uh, consultation with stakeholders. So, so I think uh, 
on, on the one hand, probably, uh, yes, you, you're right. But on the other hand, we do have uh, a, a clear, uh, say, um, boundary uh, or, 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 or limits in, in terms of our role. Thank you very much, Dr. Nola. Nobody said it was easy to be a boundary organization. <laughs> sure, so, I so I'd encourage the panelists to have a look at the Q&A and the chat. Um, and also, feel free to, I'm going to open the, the opportunity for the panelists to respond to whatever questions they like. But we, we need the participants to pose some more tough questions for them. So I'm, I'm going to help summarize one of the clusters, but I'm sure there's many more. And any panelist can answer. You don't have to answer each question, but I'll get you started. Looking at the questions I get from the floor and from the comments made by the panelists, I think one of the really big questions is, is the problem really about a lack of knowledge? Or does it have more to do with the way decisions are made about large-scale water infrastructure? Is the problem really about lack of knowledge? Or does it, you know, does the, that we have these threats to ecosystems and livelihoods and they're difficult to address? Is the problem really about lack of knowledge or does it have more to do with the way decisions are made about large-scale water infrastructure? Can anybody like to have a, I'll paste this into the text into the Q&A. Please, I'll, I'll do my... Should I give it a shot? Sure, please do, do Dr. Anula. It's fantastic. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Louis. I, I'm, I'm sure my colleagues uh, have, have a view on this. Um, but I, I think uh, personally, um, you know, knowledge is very important. Right. So, so at the MRC, like I said before, uh, we, we, we fully believe in the science, but also science is a process, right? So science is also about trust. Uh, so, so the creation and use of knowledge is a process, right? So, um, so, so far, um, a lot of the science that has been produced are sort of uh, supply driven, right? Meaning uh, either researchers or, or, or particular groups or even the Mekong River Commission secretary itself uh, produce science uh, for for what we think is important, right? and 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 of course, then we go through consultations, we go through um, some sort of uh, promotion of that science, but it gets so far, right? So so I think um, you know we we can learn from that and 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 say that maybe science should be more demand driven. So who who are you trying to influence? So, so I'm not I'm not talking anything new here. Uh, so, so, so if you're trying to influence energy policymakers, uh, did you consult them? Did you work with them? Did you take them out to lunch uh, enough? Uh, so say, what, what are they looking for in terms of supporting their decision, their planning, uh, et cetera? And then, and then work on the basis of that. But of course, then you have to, to consult with, with different voices and making sure that, okay, I'm trying to meet that objective but in a way that is also maybe palatable for, for other stakeholders that also find the, the, the consequence of these decisions uh, very important. So I think, I think uh, some of the science that have been produced so far um, you know, could, be, could be better produced in terms of gaining that trust, uh, getting a, a legitimate process from, from, from own angles, right? So, uh, so I think that that would be my, my, my two cents. That's a really clear. Um, answer on the side of technical science and technical knowledge. But I don't know, Sila, if you have any comment on from the perspective of local knowledge. I mean, is it the same constraints which apply? This is not about the role of the MRC. This is what, what do you think, Sila? Or Tanapon, if you have any comment on this question. Please, Sila. You need to unmute. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, can you repeat the question again? <laughs> because okay, I put it in the box. Right the, yeah. Um, is it, is it, is it, is it the, the reason we're having this? Is, is, is a real problem that we don't have enough knowledge? We need more knowledge, or is it more about the way decisions are made about large water, scale, water large scale water infrastructure? Is the problem no, lack of knowledge, or is the problem more to do with decision making, or as? If you like to build on what Dr. Anulak said, is it about the fact that a lot of knowledge is being supply driven rather than demand driven? He sees as one of the limitations. So is local knowledge. Hello? Yes, yeah. please. Can I? I think, yes, please. Go ahead, Tanapon. I come back to you, Sila, when you're ready, if that's the question. Okay, good. So 
Yeah, maybe uh, to uh, supplement Dr. Anulak's uh, 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 comments. So I would say that the knowledge of the Mekong uh, in the last 10 years is increased a lot. We know a lot of things, you know, link between the physical, biology, social, and economic. In the part, in the last 10 years, these are still the main gap. But most of the knowledge gap have been filled since the last uh, 10 years. So I would say that now it's a problem on, on the on the decision uh, making, you know. We may need to be more focused on how to use the science to influence the decision maker in different sphere. As Dr. Lulak said, it's gonna be, uh, uh, we have to work more to use science to influence the energy, and also maybe not only the energy, as we look at the process of large scale development, right? They need to, uh, take into uh, account also the financial mechanism like bank, how bank also respond on, on this kind of uh, implication, you know, how the science or evidence is used in terms of financial decision making. So that is also what I would like to, to, to suggest. What about Dr. Anulak's point about being a bit more demand driven rather than supply driven? Do you have any comment on that? Dr. Tanapong. Again, please, uh, Dr. Louis. Dr. Analak was pointing out that science, and a lot of the assessment process and science process have been rather science-driven, research-driven, rather than demand-driven by the country governments, maybe more focused on economic development, for example. Do you think that is a reason why, too? Yes, yes. Okay. Dr. S sorry, S Ms. Sila, do you have any comments on this question? Thank you very much, Dr. Tanapong. Hi. Uh, yes, I agree that uh, the knowledge is very important, both the science uh, uh, knowledge uh, data and also the local knowledge. Because uh, like Dr. Tanapon mentioned before, the, the, the story or the data or the information of the Mekong right now, uh, uh, there are many uh, research about the Mekong uh, issue. It's uh, the information of the Mekong have been heard not only in the regional but also in the international and uh, uh, we need to use that data to apply in the decision making it's very important we have data but if we don't use the data uh, to make the uh, uh, good proper plan and uh, use it for the making decision so it's nonsense even though we have the good data, good information, we need to have the people, especially the, the uh, decision, decision maker to use that data. We need to have the uh, platform to share and how can they use the information and data. Because sometimes, uh, yes, at the high uh, decision maker, they, they reject the local knowledge. They just uh, support the scientific data. But sometimes when the scientific data show the data, they also don't use it properly. So we need, we need to look for the platform. How can uh, uh, both knowledge and data uh, be used in the uh, decision uh, making and the uh, planning? Okay, the panelists. Um... Before the Q&A, the participants to this webinar have been asking you some questions. I don't know if any of you have any questions you'd like to now answer. Thank you for answering mine, or my cluster. But then, for example, there's been a few comments about China. Does anybody want to make any comments on, on that? Well, remember this webinar is focused primarily on the links between knowledge and decision making, all kinds of knowledge. What about to each other? You've heard each other speak. Does, does anything that Dr. Anulak said trigger anything in your case, Sila, make you wonder about how you link work by CSOs with international intergovernmental bodies with research groups? Would a partnership do more? Anybody would like to? pick up one of the questions from the participants or consider what you've been, other panelists have said, comment? Is 
if you want to speak, just unmute. Uh, Go. I just I I would like to share a little bit about the policy discussion dialogue uh, last year that uh, one of the other may Gong tried to uh, organize in in December 2009. So uh, in Cambodia, we bring a uh, seven uh, ministry uh, to discuss about uh, what is the future of the the Mekong, but uh, because uh, there are uh, seven ministry from the Ministry of the Tourist, Ministry of the Environment, they talk in different perspective about the uh, uh, making the Mekong alive. And uh, this is the good initiative. And also, uh, like uh, this, this, this month, uh, the fishery and recession understand about the declining of the uh, the endangered fish species so they try to uh, uh, support the world fish migration day by the release uh, uh, some fish to the river so this is the very uh, good start they they understand about the number of fish decline and they uh, doing something uh, to restore that uh, resource so I saw one question uh, from the group about the community. They understand about the environmental. Yeah, people understand about the change because they live along the Mekong River. They understand the change, uh, especially the water level about the fish catch change a lot compared to the... the... So if you live along the river, you maybe can observe that water levels fluctuate in unusual ways. But how do you know the causes? Uh, the local people uh, uh, don't mention about the real cause because they just uh, uh, see the chain. We know okay. about the chain. Yeah, okay. for example, the water level in the Mekong in March, in Tung Trang province, some area is the drought and in the Lesa River also drought in some area and people difficult to find fish to eat. And uh, we also have the, this is the problem of the water flow. It's not, cannot predict anymore. And also the climate change. And some people before they can go to work outside and the COVID coming and they destroy everything. Uh, and the, the people living uh, in the region, especially in Cambodia, where I met, where I talked to, they affect a lot from uh, uh, the the risk of uh, from the Mekong decline and the climate change and the COVID. Okay, thank you very much, Sila. Dr. Anulak or Dr. Tanapon, do you have anything you'd like to add seeing the questions? Dr. Anulak, about half the three quarters of the questions are for you. Are there any that you would like to answer today? You don't have to answer them all right away, of course. Uh... I try to flip through, Luis. Um, which which particular one would you like me to answer? I, I like you to answer ones that are related to knowledge. Okay, knowledge. Uh, okay, Doctor Shainis, he agreed. Okay, lack of knowledge. Yeah, it, about, it, it, it's, it's a question yeah. about about the information on tributaries, which is quite interesting from Sumia Thai. The place of tributaries and it's asking for an update on understanding. Can you read that question? Can you tell us more about the place of tributaries post the 1995 agreement in the MRC BDP, hmm. especially with regards to the priority environmental protection and priority to enable inclusive access and utilization of water and related resources? So they're wondering how main stem versus tributaries and now being a corporate. Has there been any change or evolution yeah. in thinking of the yeah, here, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Lewis. Um, I think um, here there, there, there is a, what is it, um, uh, a, both a limitation and an opportunity. Um, I think one limitation is that the 1995 agreement in terms of, say, uh, you know, development or implementation of procedures for, for managing of the basin, they don't include tributaries, right? So for example, if a country wants to do a large scale project on the tributaries, uh, they do not have to pass through the MRC prior consultation process, for example. Um, but for the mainstream, they have to. Uh, so that's limitation. Uh, but the opportunity is that the, for, for, the, for the mandate of the MRC in terms of uh, 
river basin monitoring and assessment and planning covers the whole basin, right? So, so when we do uh, assessment and monitoring, we have you know stations, of course, in cooperation with member countries, uh, to get data information from tributaries. They are fed into the assessment process, and then we are proposed uh, recommendations, right? But again, the, um, the guidelines and um, strategies at the national level, which now I, I would say the tributaries level, are still voluntary in terms of implementation. So there is a limit there. But in terms of the science that could be produced and the recommendation that could be produced and the facilitation and promotion of that knowledge, uh, it, it does not limit, right? So, uh, so I think we, we need to work together uh, both from the sort of regional level where MRC works to the national level to, to local NGOs like uh, Shaley's NGO uh, to, to uh, you know, bring that knowledge into, um, uh, into their national processes. So each, each country have different mechanism in terms of uh, how stakeholders can participate, how decision makers consider comments and things. So the MRC has no mandate to, to interfere with that. Um, but 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 there are so many channels uh, that that can be that can be uh, you know that can produce and 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 promote the signs that that NGOs or, or academics uh, can can produce with MRC and then relying on those stakeholders to champion uh, at the national and local levels. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Tanapon. I had one other question for you that goes back to the comments made about China early on. I'm wondering, as the number of mainstream and tributary dams, I think tri tributary infrastructure or even planned large-scale water diversions for irrigation too, which might be all within the tributaries and not affect the, be affected by the background agreement. How important is that we consider the cumulative impacts like has been done in some of the assessments? Done upon? And is it changed? Has things, have things changed as we move to a regulated river? What's changed? What has to change in the way we think about the future? Okay, okay. Thank you, uh, Kul Luis. So, in terms of uh, hydropower development in the upper part in the China, uh, there are many, I would say, many, many, many study in science about the cumulative impact on the hydropower development uh, uh, in the upper part on the river flow and the sediment in the down in the downstream of a uh, science evidence uh, on this. So, and actually from the uh, observation monitoring, it's already show the evidence of the change in the flow pattern and the sediment as I show in the presentation. So that's why the most important now uh, in the downstream, on how to manage or adapt to the chain. This is about the, the data sharing from the China. And as I mentioned, I think uh, there's a good news already in last uh, week that China, uh, they opened more to share the data around year to the lower Mekong country. Uh -huh. So that is very important information to set the upstream condition and to use that to plan for the downstream adaptation or local plan. So I think that is a good uh, kind of signal from the upper part. And also, uh, uh, as you know, that uh, there are a new mechanism called Lanshang Mekong Corporation that also uh, kind of includes six countries together to work together. So this is another platform that also can maybe uh, help to uh, have more exchange in terms of data between the country. And also, we will help to improve the decision making. We will help also to get more kind of feedback from the local knowledge, you know, in the decision making. I would like to highlight here is uh, if you look at the decision making, it's always make a decision at the national level. Also, the data is belong to the national level. So that's why my point here is maybe uh, in terms of science, we need to focus more on the, on the national level 
why we know that of course the regional level platform is very important to be a cooperation to be a kind of uh, engagement and to look at the transparency implication but however the decision is made at the national level so that is the point thank you thank you dr tadapon sila i wonder if you, you would like to reflect a bit on civil society and you've worked more from a civil society perspective so far most of the people have been talking about how policy actors that work at the international re arena or on the national level can interact and make use of knowledge or not uh, as, as they see fit. But what about civil society? Is it important for them to work across countries or do you just can work alone in Cambodia, happily in Cambodia? Does collaboration with Thai civil society organizations, with Lao civil society, with Chinese CSOs, does that help? Is it important? Actually, it's, it's very important uh, to work across the uh, country. And uh, for example, the Wanda Adam Bacon project, uh, we uh, have a different uh, partner who also like a fish by working in Lao and also uh, other uh, project partner university uh, from different uh, area. And uh, we try to uh, talk to research and also uh, we build capacity by all research results and uh, develop the uh, awareness raising and outreach activity uh, through, uh, for example, the dialogue with the uh, expert and also the, uh, we have uh, engaged the uh, expert on different uh, area. Uh, to talk with the uh, different people, uh, especially the pe people in the country and also at the, uh, outside the, through a different uh, platform. For example, we have the uh, Facebook page, we have a YouTube to share information and then we get a feedback from other to, this is the, the way that uh, we work and then the, uh, the project uh, produce the result and the, the publication can share in public to other people, yeah. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Okay, we've got a few more questions in the chat box and in the Q&A. Some of them are not easy to understand, though they sound interesting. Um, one person's, I think I, and luck, you've got some interesting questions. I'm not sure if you can, uh, if you can see. Yeah, Luis, uh, maybe you, you as moderator can can pick some because uh, okay. there's so many here. There's uh, so many. Most of them, <laughs> one of the other themes is, you can see that one of the undercurrent themes is people are worried that when governments negotiate or international bodies come up with regional plans, whether the local voice is really part of the process of decision-making. No, that's always the concern. And just having one village represented or one NGO represented may not do enough to get the local perspective on the benefits and risks of development, right? Mm -hmm. Projects is yeah. often uh, opportunities. So anybody on that topic? Dr. Tanapon. Yeah, Kului. Yeah, I think I can see that concern too. But as I mentioned, I think this is also related to the national policy and legal framework, right? So that's sure. why we need to ensure that at the national level, the uh, environmental policy, uh, social policy need to be further, further strengthened to ensure that uh, the local voice are uh, integrated into the uh, planning process or decision making process. I mean, uh, if the national uh, policy and legal framework on these aspects are still weak and have still many gaps, and of course, it's going to link to the regional platform that they cannot, uh, they don't have mandate to. To, to address that kind of issue. So that's why I, I would say that uh, uh, we need to focus at the national level on the social and environmental uh, framework, legal framework. Without disagreeing with you fully, Tanapon, I keep thinking, what is the status of democracy in the six countries we're talking about, right? I mean, it's hardly, all, all the countries are basically partial democracies and that's the model they have and that's the reality. And in partial democracies, some of the states are quite paternalistic and speak as if they're trying to take care of their people. 
and they may do so most of the time, but the idea of participation and consultation is not the, the biggest norm at, at all. In fact, for some countries, being overly active as a CSO or an environmentalist gets you killed. And the same for journalists. So it's not the easiest situation. Now we can talk about an idea world, but the real world for the last 20 or 30 years I've been in the region has been, what can we do in the absence of we're, we're dealing with partial democracies. There's some progress and some interesting changes, but it's hardly complete. So we have. So, we're not going to get the ideal framework, I don't think. Yeah. So that's why I think this is a role of science that we have to bridging between the local and decision making. So that is, I saw the big role of the science to connect these things together. You know, because in the decision making they need the evidence or science, but however, science also can can take up uh, uh, the knowledge from the local and try to take it into the decision making. Yes. Okay. I mean, it sounds like yeah. you're talking about scientists rather than science in general. Dr. Tanapod would like to do these things and you should do them. <laughs> Excellent. Please, Dr. Anulak, I think you're about to say yeah, something. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Lewis. Uh, so, so I, yeah, I agree with Dr. Tanapod. Uh, you know, there's efforts to strengthen that uh, decision-making process in each country, recognizing the constraints that you all talk about. Uh, so, so the governance question is, is an important one, but uh, something that cannot be solved overnight. Uh, at the same time, I think at the regional level, uh, from the MRC point of view at least, uh, we're trying to do two, two things in, in the new strategy. One is, um, you know, there are a number of forums, uh, citizen forums, uh, Mekong stakeholders uh, organized by different NGOs, by academic communities, by development partner, etc. So we are wondering, for example, you know, what, how, how the outcomes uh, of these kind of processes come together and, and fed into decision making process. So each of them uh, are having, uh, you know, their own objectives. Some of them align to what the MRC is doing. So, so we are trying, I think, in the next uh, few years to, uh, to understand a little bit better and, and, and possibly to, um, to bring the outputs and to bring the important perspective that bear on the Mekong River Basin management into MRC decision making. So, so that, that is this idea about the uh, Mekong multi-stakeholder platform. Uh, so, you know, uh, sometimes um, you get also stakeholder fatigue in terms of uh, so, so many different, now we see it with webinars, right? So, uh, so I've been in 10 of these already uh, this year. So, um, so, so but what, where do these go? Uh, and, and how do we synergize? How do we summarize? How do we put them into, uh, you know, a language that decision makers can understand? Uh, so that's one. I think in, in the next few years we we will making that we will make that effort. Uh, the secondly second thing is um, how you know stake, uh, some some of the stakeholders I think have been asking MRC for for a very long time how do they uh, directly uh, you know involve into uh, sort of the some of the uh, governance body or decision making. So. Uh, I think uh, that is a very important question and, and, and something that also cannot be resolved overnight, but, but we heard those voices. Uh, there is a, a mechanism called the expert groups. Uh, right now, it's just uh, governmental actors. Some countries do invite uh, academics. So there are two ways to, to get into these expert groups. One is um, you, know, you, you try to get in through the National Mekong Committees. And, and by National Mekong Committees, I don't mean just the secretariat, right? So it's, it's, it's these multi-ministry uh, committees and they nominate experts, which, country, which some countries they do nominate, you know, non-government. So from academia, uh, possibly from local um, communities, et cetera, to, to, to come to these expert group meetings. And secondly, um, we, will we will try to find a way uh, to propose to member countries how can some of the uh, local experts or academic experts can can observe at least uh, these expert group meetings and and be invited to share some of their local expertise. So we will do that in the next in the next uh, strategic plan. So so I hope uh, because a lot of questions in the in the in the questions to me about you know how do uh, some of these stakeholder voices get into, uh, you know, when MRC conducts studies, this is only driven by, um, 
uh, external consultants or, or even people in the secretariat itself and only pass through governments. Uh, so, so those, those uh, issues uh, we know um, and uh, we are, we are trying to address them. Thank you, Anulak. I think demonstrating good practice, a uh, lot of these stakeholder platforms, demonstrating good practice in consultation, etc., may well inspire other things at other levels. Sila, any comments? Um, Is it true in the case of Cambodia? Can you have the opportunities for CSOs to be involved in National Water Resource Committee meetings improved? Yeah, like Dr. Anulak uh, mentioned, and also Dr. Tanapon uh, just mentioned, there are different uh, different uh, strategy and different uh, government that uh, different level that they allow the local so local people or local boy to talk. Or uh, they have a different consultation. For example, uh, there are uh, some consultation uh, at the ground level, but when they make decision at the high level, they not engage because there are some words that not include in the uh, main point for the uh, policy maker to make decision on that. So, uh, and the consultation at the ground level also uh, how limited. It's not, uh, yeah, I know it's uh, based on the result. We cannot do the consultation or meeting with everyone but at least majority group can join the meeting and discussion and the voice from the ground should be heard at the national level. So it's, it's challenging, I know. It's challenging, not, not everyone or not every uh, voice heard at the national level. There so are what can... different data that so they share. So... What yeah. can we do to help amplify the voice, those voices? Even if you, not everyone can go to every meeting. Dr. Anulak talked about fatigue, of stakeholder fatigue. I'm sure it's true with community members too. They don't want to have to spend 300 days of their years representing their community at meetings. Yeah. Be with their family and eat, grow fish, grow fish. And eat. How, but what yeah. can we do to amplify the voices to give more opportunities for local communities? Uh. Yeah, they, they may have the, 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 the level discussion at the ground level, and then uh, maybe can representative to join uh, during the discussion, like uh, Dr. Anulak just mentioned, that uh, they plan to have the expert group meeting and engage representative to discuss and to share the information from the ground. So it's, it's the very uh, good initiative that can bring uh, all, all group of the uh, stakeholder to discuss and make a good decision together about the Mekong. Okay, I have one question for all three of you now. We've talked a bit about co-production process, but I'm wondering if people have examples where research, scientific knowledge, with or without local knowledge, has had an influence on policy that is important for water infrastructure decisions. Has anybody got any examples where a piece of research piece of science had a good influence and why did they have an influence? What did they, what did they do right? Uh, yeah, maybe I'll give a shot. Um, there, there are a few examples, I think, uh, from, from the MRC point of view, uh, you know, this, um, I think if you've got a clear procedure and um, both at the regional and national level, and then you have clear guidelines in terms of what to do, I think there will be follow. For example, um, when, when this, this MRC procedures are on prior consultation process. So for any uh, project that, you, that a country wants to do at a mainstream, right, be it a dam, be it a big irrigation diversion, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you have to go through the MRC six month prior consultation process. I know about the views about you know, different stakeholders on this process, but, but, but to us it's uh, indispensable because uh, at the national level, before a project is proposed, the developer, the private developer uh, have to take the MRC preliminary design guidance on mainstream dam and try to follow that as much as possible. Uh, and if they cannot follow that, they have to justify why. 
right? So, so, so for all of the submissions that we get, we have, of course, different uh, quality, but, but through the uh, consultation process, um, you know, the, the project has been improved. You can see in Sayaburi, you know, the, the number of uh, investment and additional studies that have been done following the guidelines. So, and the guidelines, how, how, how was the guideline produced? They're produced from science, right? So they're produced from the best existing technical knowledge on how fish pass should be done, how navigation locks should be optimized, how sediment should be transported, how dams should be coordinated, um, and how um, you know, different flow regimes should be maintained. So, so those are not just come from uh, my head or your head, they're, they're, they're from science. And, and those science is put into a guidelines and, and, and they are obligated to use by uh, procedures that have been accepted by four member countries and internalized at the national level. So, so I think if you have all of that, you have some uh, chance for science to be successful. But of course, you know, uh, you know, there are different views about this process and how it could be improved or not. Um, and and we, are, we are working on that, but at least you have that process and, 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 and back up by science in place. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tanapon. Dr. Tanapon Asira, any examples where in your work, scientific research has had a significant influence on decision making and policy? Yes, uh, I think uh, an example for, your work, for our work, right? We also have uh, actually uh, work under the project on the data sharing particularly uh, B2B in the sick country in the last two years and provide recommendation about the critical data that we uh, see that uh, is important for, for, for the Mekong River. And now, as you mentioned, like China already uh, uh, shared the raw year data, but however, we also recommend that uh, uh, there are still gap in terms of drought monitoring and flow fluctuation monitoring and now I think this is already a part of MRC uh, strategic, you know, to strengthen this gap. So uh, that also can be a kind of a good success, you know, to use science to influence the, the decision making and set up the priority for them. Thank you. Dr. Tanapon, dealing with dry periods, dealing with droughts, presumably flow records and droughts, that's a little bit more sensitive than worrying about floods, isn't it? A bit more tricky. Well, Again, I'm wondering when you deal with droughts or water unusually dry years, releasing all the flow information that is, is a little bit tricky, isn't it? Hasn't it proven difficult in the past for collaboration on this that type of data? Or do you think it's not problematic? People will yeah, cooperate. Yeah, I think it's not a I think it's not a problematic, you know. So it's it's was that uh the information I think uh uh, it's important to at least use for the, the forecasting or set up the early warning. That is the main issue for the local people that I listen from the crowd. Now they know that it's changing. They are aware, particularly in example in Thai side, but however, they are required to the uh, government that can we know the information beforehand at least seven to 14 days in advance. So they can plan for adapt you know so that okay, why that's this quite is short term. yeah 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 not it's just like a day before uh <laughs> sharing you know they need something more at one and use that to to uh 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 warn the people or to make people aware on this chain so that's gonna reduce a lot of impact and also make more uh increase opportunity for people to adapt within a, a time frame that they they can do, yes. Or will they start protesting and ask for dam releases from upstream storage? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, too, okay. But information has a double-edged sword always. Okay, thank you very much. We're getting near there towards the end of our seminar. Um, we've got maybe five, 10 minutes left, I think. Um, does anybody, I, I'd like to give each of the panelists a chance to make their f final comments and the other observations. If you think back to our total, you know, this seminar was really about saving the Mekong, but we haven't really taught, used that rhetoric very much. Do people think, you know, saving the Mekong, saving it 
in what sense, for who, by whom, how, by when. Do you have any final, but you're welcome to answer that question or if you have any final reflections or you'd like to answer any other questions that have been asked, most of them in the chat, sorry, not in the Q&A. But I'd like to give each of the participants, the panelists say two or three minutes, if you wanna make any final messages back to us. I don't know who would like to start, Sila. You look like you might be ready to go. Some take home okay. messages for us. Thank you, Dr. Lui. Uh, actually, the one that I make on project not working alone. We work with the uh, different uh, university and also the England Fishery Research and Development Institute of the Fishery Administration uh, under the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, Fishery and Forestry. So this is uh, under the government part. And uh, the research heavily joined uh, with the government. And uh, yeah, they, uh, they will use the, the, the research result to uh, discuss with the uh, different ministry and also discuss uh, during uh, uh, talking about the uh, dam development or or something. This is that that uh, we discuss and we believe that's why we organize a different uh, dialogue uh, discussion, policy uh, uh, discussion, and also we try to build awareness and uh, capacity building to uh, different uh, students and also the youth to learn to allow the uh, Mekong uh, biodiversity and uh, understand about the uh, ecosystem service uh, that make from the uh, Mekong River. And uh, we, we need to think now about the Mekong River, not uh, tomorrow or in the future, because uh, we understand Mekong River uh, and start change, how change and change a lot. Uh, during uh, in last few years, we see uh, uh, it affect to the local people like the food, fishery, and also uh, other uh, resources. So we need to do it together to sell the Mekong. Thank you very we much. Sell for all. Yeah. Thank you very much. So clearly, cooperation, attention to fisheries, very important messages, and we haven't dealt with them quite as much as we could have in this webinar. It might be an idea for a future webinar to look more closely at fisheries and sediments and things like that. So thank you, Sila. I don't know, Dr. Anulak or Dr. Tanapong, would either of you like to make your final comments? Please, Dr. Anulak. Yes, uh, th th thank you, Louis. Um, yeah, uh, it, it has been a pleasure and, and uh, you know, to listen to, uh, to our uh, seminar today. Um, I think maybe two points as a way of, of conclusion. One is that uh, I think each of us has a role to play. Uh, the question is, how do we help each other better, right? So, so, so you know, uh, an NGO is trying to to do what they do. Uh, sometimes we hear about their efforts. Sometimes we don't. Uh, you know, researchers produce science uh, in hope of uh, influence policy, especially think tanks or, 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 or sort of research institutes for policy impact. You know, but sometimes we don't hear about it. And, and we are trying to, you know, uh, sort of produce science for in support of member countries sort of cooperation. So, so how do we help each other uh, more? I think it's a, it's a question that each of us need to think about. Uh, I have a suggested a few uh, things already in this seminar on how we should work together. So that's number one. Number two, I think uh, people should, uh, I, I'm, I'm not speaking just a representative of MRC. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, some of the, because some of the questions in the um, comments, um, you know, of course, it may be from a devil's advocate point of view, uh, but uh, you, you need to appreciate the existence of the Mekong River Commission. You know, if, if you uh, go into, uh, say, uh, developing countries' basins where they have conflicts and tensions, where, they, where there's no data sharing, when they have projects going on and there's no dialogue, uh, and, and there's threats of wars and conflicts, all of these things. And then you look at the MRC and, and the Mekong, you, 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 you could appreciate, you know, we, we, at least the governments are coming together, at least they are sharing information, at least they're trying to talk and, and, and trying to work together. There's no threats of pulling out, there's no threats of war, there's no, uh, all of those things. So, um, so, so, you know, uh, we, we need to thank the, the member countries. We need to thank the development partners for, for putting their uh, resources, investment, and time uh, to, to have these institutions. Uh, 
but of course, we need to strengthen that, as as I said in my in my um, opening for the for the new strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tanapon. Much appreciated. It's very important. Dr. Tanapon, you have more or less the final word. Okay. Thank you for giving me a last chance to do <laughs> conclude on the webinar here. So, in my uh, opinion, uh, in terms of who to be safe, I have uh, two uh, priority. Uh, one is the vulnerable, vulnerable people who uh, have direct impact from the chain. I think those groups still underestimate and they don't have uh, fully support yet to uh, come over the challenge of the chains. And second one I think is very important is to save the remaining the ecosystem in the Mekong and biodiversity for the next generation. So if we keep this trend going on, so I think the, our uh, ecosystem service uh, and diversity will become more degradation. So that's why uh, I think uh, we, everyone in the Mekong or even outside the Mekong have to be, uh, get that focus and on spot and also try to communicate to the decision maker that uh, we don't want them to uh, go beyond the, I don't know, like how to say that maybe tipping point, you know? Like in example, the climate change uh, issue that we try to save the world to under the two degree. If the Mekong uh, uh, basin can also quantify the tipping point that uh, we could not go beyond this limit of the ecosystem service, that's gonna also help everyone to get clear message to the policy maker. So that's all, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tanapon. On behalf of all participants, I'd like to really thank uh, uh, three panelists, they can't all see you, but maybe you can send them a text message. They have very complimentary presentations. Cooperation is clearly important. Um, just some brief information. The Earth Journalism Network will be posting a recording of this webinar on its website, which is earthjournalism.net in the next few days. We also have more webinars coming up and post on the website, so feel free to look up them. So thanks to SCI and Summonet and to Internews and the Earth Journalism Network for organizing this. And thank you to all the participants. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all your questions. So the chats and the Q's and A's bubbling up on each side. I tried to pick and choose. So thank you very much and have a good afternoon, everyone. Much appreciate your contributions. So thank you.